Welcome, everyone. My name is Chris Paoli, editor, and I am pleased to be moderating our first session as well as welcoming you to our Digital Transformation and Unified Communications for SMBs Summit, brought to you by Vonage. The editorial staff of RedmanMag.com have worked hard to bring some of the best independent experts on this topic, so we really hope you enjoy it. <coughs> Before we start today's event with these three great sessions, we do have some announcements. First, we want to let you know this event is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. You'll receive an email when the replay is available, generally within the next few days. Each of today's three sessions will be followed by a 5-10 to 10 minute Q&A. So please be sure to put your questions into the Q&A area of your console as they come up so we can get them answered for you at the end of the session. During today's third session, we will be giving away a pair of high-end Bose noise-canceling headphones, but you must be present to win. So be sure to stay on for the entire event. Finally, we do have resources from our sponsor Vonage available on the console right now. So please download and check those out. It's because of Vonage's underwriting of this content that we can bring you the summit. So we thank them for sponsoring and supporting the community and ask you to check out these resources so we can bring you more events in the future. Now on to the first session of today's summit, top UC myths debunked and what you need to know instead. This session features Howard M. Cohen, senior resultant at the Tech Channel Partners Results Group. Howard is a 40-plus year executive veteran of the information technology industry who today writes for and about the IT channel. He's a frequent speaker at IT industry events that include Microsoft Inspire, Citrix Synergy Summit, ConnectWise IT Nation, Channel Pro Forums, Cloud Partner Summit, MicroCore One-on-One, -on -one, and CompTIA ChannelCon. He also frequently hosts and presents webinars for many vendors and publications. Take it away, Howard. Thank you, Chris, and good morning, everybody, or good noon to some of you. Um, today's presentation, as Chris said, is Digital Transformation and Unified Communications. We're going to dispel some myths about UC um, and have some fun doing it. Uh, those of you who have been in any of my presentations in the past know that I like to begin every session with a word of the day, and today is no different. Today's word is connection. And I chose connection because I wanted to be able to hook up unified communications with digital transformation as follows. Okay. When we work, when we work with other people, we used to gather in one place and get our work done. Of course, today, um, we don't gather in one place. We work from wherever we are, and we connect to each other over a network. Um, Unified Communications is a suite of services that makes that easier and much more productive. So if you're talking about a digital transformation in which we're going to make things easier for people, we're going to make it more fun, more enjoyable, and more fulfilling for them to do their job, because that's what a digital transformation is, You've got to connect them to each other. And so Unified Communications does that. Okay, that connection established, let's start by defining what is Unified Communications. Okay, what is Unified Communication? Well, it, the, the long version is integration of real-time and asynchronous communication and collaboration services. That's a mouthful. The fact is, it basically gives you any way in which you'd like to communicate or collaborate, um, and you can pick and choose as you go. It begins with presence so that you know who's out there. You know who's connected into the network right now. Some people may be in meetings. Some people may be away from their desk or away from their phone. You'll know that before you even try to connect. You can send uh, an instant message, a chat, or even SMS. doesn't matter who they are, where they are, what organization they're part of, you can reach them with a text. You can call them, and you can call them either within your network using your data network itself, your IP network, uh, or you can use the public switch telephone network. So you can reach anybody. You always have voicemail. Usually that voicemail is sent to your email inbox. 
along with anything else and everything else. You have a uni universal inbox for everything. Um, you can do vi most people think of video conferencing when you say unified communications. So clearly there is video conferencing from one-on-one -on -one to many. Um, you can now use whiteboards so that everybody can draw on the board and share their ideas and share their thoughts graphically. You can share applications. You can share data. Um, you can even simultaneously edit the same document. So if you have 9, 10, 12 people on a team, they can all be working on the document at the same time, and you see where everybody's working because it's marked with their initials. So that's really, really productive. And oh yeah, you can still get faxes um, over most uh, unified communication services. Uh, healthcare is one industry that seems to still use fax a lot. Uh, other than that, I haven't seen much of it lately. Okay, so now we've got a fairly good definition of unified communications. I want to focus in on the word integration because integration is a feature of a unified communication system that very few people ever really think of. What I mean is this. Unified communication is an application or a set of applications running on a computer network. The same as your word processor, your spreadsheet, uh, your ERP, your CRM, you know, whatever other software you're using, they're on the same system. And the unified communication console that your users see on their mobile phone or their desk phone or their laptop or their tablet, well, it can contain everything. It can be their hub. They can start there and get to anything and everything they need, which means they don't have to hunt around for anything anymore. It's all in that one place. And many organizations love that ability to keep their employees on one screen all day long, just jump, you know, jumping from application to application and coming back to the hub. So integration of everything is a powerful advantage of unified communications that really goes unsung. Uh, and I think it's something you ought to consider as you're looking at uh, unified communication solutions. Okay, so let's get to our myths. I love this. Here are our top UC myths debunked. We'll debunk them, and we'll tell you what you need to know instead. Many people approach unified communications as a replacement for their PBX. Okay, so they have a box somewhere in their building that all the phones connect to, and then that box connects them to trunks of telephone circuits on the public switch telephone network. And there are many different ways in which that can be hooked up, but all of them are fairly sophisticated, require sophisticated management. Um, and these days, those PBXs are doing nothing but aging. So when many people think about replacing their aging P PBX with something else, they look at UC. They look at unified communications. And the fact of the matter is that it is. UC is a great replacement for a PBX. And I'll show you some reasons why in a moment. But the bottom line is it's a whole lot less expensive to approach. Also, it's much more, much more than just a phone service replacement. I'll call your attention back to the last slide. You saw all the things we can do in a unified communications environment. PBXs don't do most of that, almost any of it. So it's way more than just a PBX replacement. Next myth, you can't keep your own phone numbers when you move off your PBX to unified communications, and that is bogus. When you switch to unified communications, you can choose your numbers from them. They can provide you with the numbers. Uh, you can buy numbers if you want to buy a number that spells out your company name or something. You may have to invest in it. Uh, or you can easily transfer your existing numbers from your PBX to your unified communications. You fill out a transfer application. The, the uh, UC provider reaches out to your existing carriers and transfers your, your phone numbers for you. So, bam, you get to keep your number. And so that myth, dispelled, debunked, move on. Myth, you lose control over your phone system when you move off the PBX to unified communications. 
And I think we've already hinted at the reality of that. Here, let's take a look at the typical control console for a typical unified communication system. Okay, here's the administrative dashboard of a, a popular um, unified communication service. And everything is kind of easy, right? You can see that you have 116 extensions on the system and only 77 are in use right now. Um, at the bottom, you see you can choose your number um, or keep your number. The ability to do all those things is right there. It's right there. You just click it. Up in the bottom, up at the top right, excuse me, are all the system features, and you can check the status of any of them. As you look down the menu on the left, you can see there are you know, very simple to understand other things available to the – and this is for the guy or gal who manages the unified communication service. This is not even the user interface. The user interface is even simpler than this. So if you were to look at the typical PBX, it looks like a computer operator's screen. There are long lists of data. There are all kinds of clicks and buttons and links and who knows what. It's much more sophisticated, requires special training. You don't lose control. You gain control. Another myth is that the biggest problem with unified communications is getting users to adopt it. Okay. Well, first of all, if that's true for UC, UC is in good company. Because the fact is, statistically, 75% of projects that fail, fail because the users don't adopt it. It's the biggest cause of, of project failure in the systems integration business. And you know, UC is no different. It's, it's an application just like all the others. Uh, the thing is, if you want to get users to adopt it, Train them. Okay, it doesn't take a long time. Training on a unified communication service is extremely simple and extremely quick. Now, the fact of the matter is, users fail to adopt not because it's so difficult to operate. That's not the reason. Now, take this tip with you as you go. Uh, the reason they don't adopt is because they don't know why they should. They don't know what's in it for them. What's the benefit to them of moving off of what they've already learned, already know, already used, everything they're used to and comfortable with? Why should they move off of that to something else? There's got to be a return. And if you can demonstrate to your users that they get tremendous benefit out of using this new approach, they'll adopt in a heartbeat. The other thing is that the interfaces that they use are common there are things like mobile phones, smartphones, tablets, um, laptops and desktops, things that they're very, very used to using. I mean, look on the left side of this, these two devices, and you'll see a typical phone dial. That's how they dial the phone in a unified communications environment. On the right side, you can see a very simple menu of all the other applications they need, and they can get to them right from there. And smack in the middle, we're video conferencing, and you can see by the buttons that are on there, you know, you can see who's on, you can see who's talking right now. Anybody who's done video conferencing on any platform knows it's, it's really easy. So adoption is not a burden. It is not a, an obstacle. And anybody who tells you that, they're thinking of another kind of application. This is a simple world for people to work in, and they very quickly realize that they get a lot more bang for their buck. Next myth, UC is just for large enterprises. Only the biggest companies are using unified communications. And this is just as good a time as any for us to introduce the term UCAS, Unified Communications as a Service. And I like to refer to it as the ideal SMB choice. Today's session is for SMB, so you know, I want to focus on what's best for our audience. And, and UCAS is it. What is UCAS? Well, basically in UCAS, the Unified Communications Service 
is inside the cloud. You don't have your own unified communications server. You don't have your own unified communications infrastructure, storage, power condition. You don't have a data center for this. Right. You just simply subscribe to a popular, available, unified communication service. And it's very, very easy to do. Um, and then when you get another user, you subscribe them to your account, your service. Uh, whether you have a laptop, a desktop, a, a smartphone, or a tablet, you simply connect to the Internet, and you have an application that gives you access to everything your unified communication service does. Okay, so UCAS is vo more than likely the solution that everybody who's on this call should be looking at. Next myth, that unified communications is only for internal communications. You can only communicate with other people in your company on your network. And that's obviously just not true. Okay, UCAS, every UCAS service offers you a connection to the public switch telephone network. That means you pick up the phone in your office, excuse me, you pick up the phone in your office and you dial. And that call goes out over your data network. It does. It leaves your building traveling on your data network. It then hits your router and goes to um, the unified communication service you're using, at which point they connect you right there to the public switch telephone network. They route that call for you. And you don't see any of that. You don't know any of that. You don't have to dial 9 or anything like that. You just dial. The system figures it out, and now you're connected to somebody's phone a thousand miles away, and you don't know the difference. Okay, so when you have this kind of PSTN connection, you have access to everybody. Anybody who's operating on the public switch telephone network, anybody who's on the Internet and is connected into their unified communication service, you can always reach them. And based on the telephone number you dial, your unified communication service figures out where that call goes, whether it's your network, the Internet, or the public switch telephone network. That is completely automatic. Okay. Next myth. Unified communications requires large investments, you know, capital investments in hardware and software, and then ongoing uh, expense, you know, regular expenses uh, in services and whatnot. And the answer to this one is not necessarily. Okay, I won't completely debunk it. What I will say is that if you are a large corporation with your own data center and you decide that unified communications is something you want your IT department to handle in-house or your communications department or whatever, but you want to handle it in-house, then, yeah, you're going to be investing heavily in capital investments like servers, storage, routers, switches, power conditioning, you name it. You're going to be buying all that stuff, and every three years you're going to be updating it. And in between, you're going to be managing services to connect you in to the public switch telephone network, to the Internet, and to everything else. That's all going to fall on you. And so that is going to be expensive. Those are large investments. Many mammoth corporations are looking at or are already using UCAS services. And there's less and less reason not to. I mean, it's the right way to make it. So the answer to this one is, again, UCAS. You know, UCAS, it's a subscription that you take out for each individual user, and all you do is subscribe. That's it. You simply click on the button and subscribe, and then they have access. They get the app, which they download from the App Store or the Play Store or what have you, and it's free. And then they connect it to their account, and from that point forward, they have access to everything, all in their palm, or in their lap, or wherever. Next myth. Unified communications requires excess excessive bandwidth. 
And that's just not so. Unified communications is an applica- it's, a, it's a suite of applications, okay? It runs just like any other suite of applications on your network and then across the Internet. And in this case, it may branch off to the public switch telephone network. The, where you get into increases in bandwidth, if you have a bunch of people video conferencing, that video content is going to consume bandwidth no matter how you're using it. And so it's not the unified communication that's causing excessive bandwidth. You may be texting. You may be emailing. Those don't cause excessive bandwidth. But as you start to use video, as you start to share applications, it's the applications themselves that are consuming more bandwidth. They're just using the unified communications conveyance to enable them to do it. And so it's not the nature of UC itself that consumes more bandwidth. It's the applications that it enables you to do. And if you don't want to do them, don't. And then you can pay for less bandwidth. But if you want all the benefits of UC, you may increase your bandwidth to accommodate more video conferencing, more application sharing, more simultaneous editing, more of the big stuff. Okay. Here's our next um, myth, that UC operation is expensive. Now, in one respect, we can say not necessarily to this one too, right? Because if you are operating your own unified communication servers and your own unified communications infrastructure, that's costly. You have to pay for all of it. You, you have to put that equipment in there. You have to power that equipment. You have to cool that equipment. You have to maintain that equipment. You have to connect that equipment. And, and there's a lot of expense, and you have to have people to manage all that equipment. So there's plenty of expenses in doing it yourself. That is expensive. But when you switch to UCAS, that's not true anymore. You simply subscribe and save some bucks. Just that simple. You save money um, simply by subscribing each of your users to the service as needed. Next myth, um, unified communications is difficult to install, set up, and maintain. And in the purest sense of the word, this is the only myth we'll talk about today that really isn't a myth. Again, unified communication standing alone by itself in your facility, on-prem unified communications is difficult to install is difficult to provision, is difficult to integrate, is difficult to, inst- to deploy and set up, and is difficult to maintain because it's a combination of hardware, software, and a variety of services. So, you know, it, it's, you're better off to not be doing all that. If you, if you want to make this one a myth, very simple. All you have to do is move to UCAS. And if you think I'm a UCAS advocate, you're right. I am, because I've seen company after company get rid of all kinds of expense, all kinds of burden, simply by moving to UCAS. Um, and I just don't, I don't see a logical reason why any IT director, any CIO, CTO would want to take on that fundamental service when it's done so well by the carriers who have branched out into unified communications. Here's the big myth, right? Security is a problem. Uh, Security is such a problem. They used to say that about the internet. And then in uh, 1982, in 2012, 10 years ago, they stopped saying it because the internet had proven itself. All the big providers had made such investments in security that nobody could deny that the internet was a secure way to go. So security can be a problem if you don't have one of these, right, a security operations center. And I would be willing to bet that most, if not all of you, don't have one. 
that's no surprise. It's a very expensive proposition. And most small to medium businesses can't justify that expense. But they all, at one point or another, engage with a security provider who does have a SOC and does monitor their use of the network and does you know, pre prevent bad things from happening on their network. And the people who are providing those SOC services make huge investments. And, and again, I'm going to come back to it. I, I know I've said it time after time. Unified Communications is a suite of applications running on your personal computer device. Okay? It's just like any other. Therefore, it's protected just like any other. You know, if you look at a parallel, uh, industrial control systems, the systems they use to control heat, light, and power in big office buildings used to be very, very specialized devices. They were designed and built specifically for that purpose. They had their own software that was completely different just for them. And really, there were never any security problems. Then somebody got the bright idea of basing ICS on standard PCs, standard computers, x86 devices. Within a few months, they were widely adopted and then the onslaught of security breaches happened. Here where I live in Phoenix, uh, in the middle of July, uh, bad actors would shut down the air conditioning in a building. And all of the people in the building would soon after come streaming out of the building, at which point the bad guys can go in and do whatever they want. But the fact is they couldn't breach it. They couldn't get in until it was shifted over to standard machines. UC runs on standard machines. And the good news is we know how to protect those. And so you can sign up for the same security services you've ever signed up for, and that's backed up by the security services available from the unified communications provider themselves. So you see security. You've got plenty of security there. I, I love this one. This one's kind of dated, but... Many people still tell me that, you know, when you go to UC, you, you got to use BYOD. And that can be a disaster. Nonsense. BYOD was only troublesome when somebody brought in a device that you couldn't secure with your network. It wasn't compliant with your security standards on your network. And not for nothing, but most networks are pretty specific about that. They've got pretty definitive uh, policies around what kinds of devices can work on your network. The thing is, with Unified Communications as a service, all your users' devices have to be compliant with the Unified Communications service, not your network. So, I mean, if they're going to be using it in your office building, yeah, it's got to be compliant with your network because it's probably sitting on your Wi-Fi. But if your users are using it over 4G, 5G, or their own home Wi-Fi or what have you, it just has to be compliant with the service that you're signing them up for, meaning that most of these services can, uh, can accept anything uh, or almost anything. So this stops being a problem. BYOD is more of a problem for you on your network than it can ever be for a commercial unified communications provider. And that's good news. So BYOD is not the disaster that it used to be. Another one is that UC itself is unreliable. And this one... I'm going to be the one to break it to you. The Internet is unreliable. And you see an application running across the Internet. Um, and so, really, your unified communications is as reliable as the network it runs across. 
And if indeed it's running across the entire Internet, there's going to be some unreliability built in because it's the Internet. Now, in the beginning, government, our government, back in 1969, uh, our government funded the Advanced Research Projects uh, Administration, ARPA. And ARPA built ARPANET, which was the first iteration of the Internet. And it was funded by the public, by government, by the country. Other governments caught on. And they built their own infrastructure in their countries. And so most countries own the infrastructure running in their com country, and that's why they can shut it down and block things out if they want to. More recently, carriers decided to build their own infrastructure, their own segments. Most of the un unified communications carriers try their best to keep your traffic on their network as much as possible because they can assure the quality of your transmission across their network. And so there are going to be some unified communications providers who will have higher quality than others, and in part it's based on how extensive their own network is. So that's a good thing to ask about when you're interviewing. Um, Unified communications providers. You know, how big is your network? How far does it extend? You know, if you're in multiple countries, that becomes a very important question. But even if you're domestic, all domestic, it's an important question. So um, UC is as reliable as the Internet. There is nothing about the protocols that run UC that is inherently unreliable. Those protocols work just fine. They're very efficient, and they're getting more efficient every year with more and more work being done on them by many, many different parties. So that's the way in which I address the, the reliability issue. And by the way, the Internet is no more or less um, unreliable than the public switch telephone network. There, too, you have multiple segments managed by multiple organizations, you know, local um, providers as well as regional providers and national providers and global providers. So it's the nature of the net. Oh, boy. You see, it doesn't scale well. What happens if one of your small or medium-sized businesses suddenly becomes a large-sized business or a gargantuan-sized business. Well, the first thing I want to do is pat you on the back and congratulate you. That's fantastic, right? Growth under good control is the best thing that can happen to a business. But, oh, no, we are using unified communications, and it just won't scale well. And that is absolutely, absolutely a myth. Um, for evidence, I'll turn to our good friends at Microsoft, not a small pr uh, provider in this environment. Microsoft recently said that companies are undergoing a, hey, there it is, digital transformation, right? They're undergoing digital transformation in order to improve business processes, boost engagement with their customers, meet changing needs in the market. There's all kinds of good reasons to perform digital transformation, to automate more of the processes, to improve the way people live, work, and play every day on their network. And they tell us that unified communications and collaboration are an increasingly integral part of that formula, helping geographically dispersed people who are far away from each other work together anywhere, and there it is, scale as business needs evolve. Just that simple. And again, we come back to it. The nature of UCAS is that you subscribe another user. If you take over a company, you subscribe several thousand users. It's a one-time event. If you have leftover licenses from somebody who left your company, you transfer them to your next employee. You maintain control over it. But the bottom line is good unified communication providers, the quality providers that have shown 
staying power in the industry over the last few decades, they had that scalability. You know, recognize that we first started talking about these technologies in the early 1990s with the introduction of telecommuting, which didn't catch on. But since the COVID pandemic, wow, was that an accelerator for the use of unified communications to enable remote workers to work from wherever they were. And a lot of them are still there because they found it's more efficient. They get more done working from home or working from the beach or wherever. Um, the bottom line is they discovered that this is a good way to go. And unified communications enables all of it and allows you to manage it very efficiently. Next myth, using UC, actually using it, requires intense technical training and skills. And we've really already dispelled this myth. It's really easy, right? First of all, it's easy to train people on it. You probably want to come back and give them refresher courses more on the security aspects. Good, you know, security hygiene is important. Um, but the devices are simple devices. And they're already accustomed to those. You just have to kind of show them where things are. And not for nothing, but they're pretty obvious. Next myth, uh, call quality is poor on unified community. Calls are often dropped. And that's completely dependent, as we showed before, that it's completely dependent upon who your provider is. If they've built out more of their network and your traffic stays on their network more of the time, that's going to be better. You're going to have great call quality. There's not going to be any publicly owned or nation state owned infrastructure that you have to cross that nobody can account for. So call quality can be fantastic. More and more users are reviewing UC call quality as being equivalent or better than public switch tel telephone network um, traffic. So that too is pretty much a myth as long as you select the right providers. Oh no, <laughs> myth. You need to replace all your phones. You have all these IP phones, right? Uh, or you have all of these um, PBX phones. You have all these phones. What are you going to do with them? You're going to have to replace them with IP phones, phones that are compliant with unified communications. Isn't that going to be expensive? And the answer is no. Your approach to the phones is dump them. Get rid of them. You don't need no desk phones. <laughs> you don't need desk phones. You've seen the users using mobile phones, laptops. I mean, the fact is today, if you want to hitch your PC, a Windows PC, to your um, smartphone, there is software provided by Microsoft free of charge that will allow you to do that. And when you do it, you get a soft phone on your PC, meaning you'll see a phone dial on the screen of your PC. And if you have a touch screen, you just tap the screen. If not, you just hit it with your mouse. But you no longer need a phone instrument. You can use the phone, the soft phone on the PC, and it makes all of its calls through your smartphone. Those of you who have an AI like uh, the Amazon Echo, um, that can be connected to your smartphone as well. And you can make all your calls just by asking for them. So you don't really need a hardware telephone sitting on your desk that has to be installed, has to be maintained, has to be repaired sometimes, and has to be updated every few years. More and more people are simply moving to their mobile. And not for nothing, but when they go traveling, their laptop can become their phone. So, um, so you don't need those desk phones anymore. Finally, I want to get to my favorite myth, 
the one that I keep hearing more and more all the time, and that is, can't we just use Teams? Come on. We just, you know, we'll, 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 we'll sign up for Microsoft 365, we'll get everybody on Teams, and we're done. We're all rocking and rolling. And that sounds great. Here's the thing. You're kind of almost there, right? Because this year, Microsoft introduced Teams Phone, which is a service that facilitates your ability to even more easily call anybody in your directory, and call anybody that you're, conf that you're federated with in you know, your larger community of contacts, and literally reach out and call anybody on the PSTN. The thing is, when you sign up for Teams phone, they're going to ask you which carrier you want to connect through. Make no mistake for your very own sake, Microsoft will never, I shouldn't say this, but it, all things being equal and all things remaining the same, they will never let themselves become a, a regulated utility. Okay, they had all kinds of problems uh, a couple of dozen years ago, and uh, they don't want to get even close to that. So they have no interest in becoming a regulated utility uh, and having to be compliant with all manner of government uh, regulations. They prefer to partner with a carrier. You can choose one of their carriers, one of their preferred carriers, or you can bring your own carrier. Some of the carriers, and here's something worth thinking about when you're looking for a carrier, some of the carriers who provide unified communication services have introduced their own program specifically to facilitate your operation with Microsoft Teams. So if you're becoming a Teams house or if you are a Teams house, take a look for these programs because they provide excellent ways to provision and integrate your use of Teams with your use of all of the services provided by Unified Communications and making them work seamlessly together. And there's really nothing more efficient than that. Okay, so um, look at the time. <laughs> we have run out of myths, and so we move from myths to questions. Chris, do we have any questions? We do, and uh, that's a great <laughs> reminder. Please, uh, if you have any questions for Howard, uh, get them in now, and we'll get them answered for you. Uh, let's jump right in. Lynn wants to know, what role does unified communications play in enabling digital transformation for SMBs? Okay, well, that was, the, um, <laughs> that was kind of the heart of this story, but if I wasn't crisp enough on that, and it's possible. <laughs> I talk, all, I talk all the time about digital transformation, and so many people get it wrong. They think digital transformation is upgrading your, your technology. No, that's an upgrade. That's all that is. That's an upgrade. Um, digital transformation ha is a strategic, is a strategic uh, activity. You look at what you do and how your people do it, and you figure out, how can I use technology – to make it easier for my people to do it, to make it better and more enjoyable for them to do it, to make it into more fulfilling work, or to free them up from grunt work so they can do more fulfilling work, get rid of the repetitive things that automation can do instead. You know, the, it, the idea is to allow people to explore the best of themselves by using technology to supplement it, them in the things they don't really need to be doing. So part of that is, of course, connecting people to the technology. They have to be able to interface with the technology to hand off from their part of the work to the part that's now being handled by automation. And that includes other people down the line. So you have multiple people across the network doing different things, handing off to technology, taking it back from technology, moving it along. It's a wonderful interaction that is completely facilitated by unified communications. And not for nothing, but most people spend more time looking for things than they actually do working with them. 
I mean, think about the last time you went looking for something on Google and you did a Google search. Many people hope that AI is the answer, that it can do that hunting for you, and that may be so. We're finding that out now. But think about the last time you lost your keys and had to go find your keys, um, or you had a paper document. Oh, gosh. Nobody wants to go hunting for a paper document. You know, the fact is that we want to get away from that. We want to get away from searching for everything. So if we put everything at your fingertips and you can text and you can email and you can call and you can video conference and you can edit together, whiteboard together. I mean, think about all those things you can do and they're all, boom, a click away. That has to increase productivity. That has to improve efficiency. So to me, that's the way that unified communication does what digital transformation needs most, and that is creating new efficiencies. All right, we have a clarification question for you. Um, are you uh -oh. saying small and medium businesses should not build their own unified communication systems? Okay, I'm going to surprise you with a very definitive answer. Yes. <laughs> Honestly, I am saying that. I know that there are people who think they have to keep everything in-house. Even though we've been in the cloud for a couple of decades now, they are afraid that they will be attacked. And I get it. You know, it's safer in your own four walls. But the fact is, that's a fallacy. It's not safer within your four walls. I'll ask you, who can spend more on security, you or a cloud services provider like Microsoft? Can you spend more on security than Microsoft? I don't think so. And so if you're connected to their network, you're behind their protection, you're much better protected than in your own premises. So a small or medium-sized company can't, even if they could justify it, I don't think you could justify it, but they can't do it. They can't provide as much security as they get from a provider. So why go to the expense? Why go hire people to do something that's not consistent with the business you're in? If you're a restaurant, if you're selling shoes, if you're building widgets, you're not in the IT or the you know, information systems business, but you can use people who are. You know, engage with somebody. Put somebody under contract to do that so you can hold their feet to the fire you will find it far more cost efficient, far more, far less burdensome to go to UCAS rather than build your own. It just, to, to me, it just doesn't make sense. All right, here's a great question. Uh, how do we transition from our PBX to a unified communication system? Okay, so there, there's another example. Um, and the, the, the answer, if you're using a UCAS service, is have them do it. Tell them you want to transition all of your existing inboxes and phone accounts and everything else off the PBX and over to their service, and they will do that. Um, it really is fairly simple. Uh, I, I said before you can port the numbers over. So from the perspective of the other end of those connections, that's taken care of. And then you just simply assign the corresponding numbers to the people who had them before. Um, your, your, your unified communication server, servicer makes that very easy. If you're building your own, of course, the expert you hire to do that for you will take that on. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. We do have a little bit more time, so if you do have any more questions, please get them in. Um, do you ever see unified communications eliminating the PSTN completely? Okay, now I feel like I'm uh, one of those people who gets on the phone and talks about who they'd like to murder. Uh, it's just a bad idea. Uh, but... Um, but I've said it before in public, and I'll say it now. I think the public switch telephone network has a very limited la lifespan at this point. More and more of communications is moving over to the Internet 
and to carrier networks that are interfacing to each other uh, all the time. So I don't know if it'll be five years, 10. I can't imagine it being 20 or more. I just think personally, this is my opinion based on my observations of the industry, that the public switch telephone network is losing ground. Not for nothing, but that's why you see everybody scurrying to take their place in 5G um, and the internet and those related services. They know, they know that people aren't going to be using the public switch, just like pay phones went away. I think the public switch telephone network is going to go away. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I would love to discuss that with anybody who's interested. All right. That looks like all the questions we have. Uh, thanks so much for the great talk, Howard. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everybody. Uh, everyone, stay tuned. We're going to be take a short break and be back at the top of the hour for our second session of the day. You see best practices for SMBs in 2023. Take a chance to check out those resources by your, on your console provided by Vonage, and we will be right back. Okay. Welcome back, everyone. I'm David Rammel, editor of Virtualization Cloud Review, here to moderate the second session of our summit, UC Best Practices for SMBs in 2023, brought to you by our sponsor, Vonage, a global leader in cloud communications, helping businesses accelerate their digital transformation. Our speaker for this session is Brian Posey, a 21-time Microsoft MVP, and also a commercial astronaut candidate currently in training, doing all kinds of cool stuff. Throughout Brian's career, he has written or contributed to dozens of IT books and created numerous full-length video training courses and published thousands of blog posts on a huge variety of IT and space-related topics. Many of those blog posts can be found in his Posey's Tips and Tricks column or in his new Posey's Moonshot column. Brian, it's great to have you here. Please take it away. Hey, thank you so much, David. Hello, greetings, and welcome, everyone. So today we got all kinds of stuff to talk about with regard to unified communications. It's going to be a jam-packed session. I'm going to start out by spending just a couple of minutes at the beginning defining what unified communications really is, just because I've been told that whenever we have these webcasts that we have all skill levels on the call, ranging from beginner to expert. So I just want to make sure everybody's on the same page before I really get into the meat of this. From there, I'm going to talk about some best practices with regard to what you should be looking for in a unified communication solution, and then we'll get into some deployment best practices. So that's kind of my plan for this webcast. As I said, we've got a ton of information, so let's go ahead and get into it. So to get started with what is unified communications, really the way that I would define unified communications is simply pulling multiple forms of communication into a single package. Um, that can mean a lot of different things. Now, having said that, there are some features that are typically found in unified communication solutions. Now, certainly this is not an all-inclusive list, nor does every solution out there have every feature that I'm going to be talking about, but these are some of the more common ones, uh, starting with instant messaging. That's simply real-time chat. Then we have presence information. For anybody who's not familiar with presence, it's essentially just an ability to convey your status to other people who may need to get in touch with you. Uh, for example, if you follow the blue arrow over to the right side of the screen, you can see a screen capture that was taken from Microsoft Teams. And what this particular interface does is it allows you to set your status. So right now, in that screen capture, my status is listed as available. That could change that to busy or do not disturb or be right back. And there are several other um, possibilities to use as well. The next one is telephony, uh, the ability to place a phone call. And that can be an internal phone call going from desk phone to desk phone or from PC to desk phone or vice versa or to the outside world or inbound from the outside world. Uh, so telephony is one of those things I'm going to be talking more about later on in the presentation uh, because there are some pretty important things to consider with regard to telephony as it relates to your unified communications platform. Uh, the next one, video conferencing. I'm sure we're all familiar with that, especially in the uh, post-pandemic world. And then we have voicemail, um, the ability to respond or to leave a message, rather, to somebody who's not there. 
And a few more items. Uh, collaboration. Not every unified communications platform has collaborative capabilities, but a lot of them do. Sometimes this is, simple, is as simple as a shared whiteboard uh, that multiple users can doodle on at the same time. But other applications have more elaborate uh, collaborative functionality built into them. Then we have things like call routing. Uh, call routing comes in a lot of different forms. That's something else I'm going to be talking a little bit more about as we go along. But this is the ability to forward calls throughout the organization. And sometimes this is based on logic. For example, you may want to route calls differently based on time of day. Uh, for example, if somebody calls during business hours, then that call may go one place. Whereas if they call after hours, then that call may need to get routed elsewhere. Uh, then we have things like SMS text messaging, fax, email. Auto attendant probably needs a little clarification. Um, auto attendants are another one of those things that can come in many different forms. But if you've ever called a business and gotten the press one for English, two for Spanish, three for whatever, that's an example of an auto attendant. It simply routes a call differently based on input from the caller. And then the last one on the list, calendar and scheduling. So those are some of the more common um, features of unified communications platforms. So as I mentioned a moment ago, there are numerous unified communication platforms available. And those platforms vary widely in terms of their cost, their feature set, their capabilities, the platform that they run on, whether they're hosted on-premises in the cloud or if it's a hybrid solution that uses a little bit of both. Um, now, one thing to keep in mind as you look at a unified communication sy systems is that sometimes features aren't necessarily the same from one platform to another. So you might have a particular vendor that starts out specializing in one particular form of communication, so they're really strong in that particular form, and then some of the others are completely bare bones. Uh, for example, you may have a provider that's really strong in video conferencing, but they offer the bare minimum instant messaging capabilities. Uh, the reason why that happens, well, it probably varies from one vendor to another, but what I've seen in my own experience is that when you go shopping for software, oftentimes the software vendors will post a matrix on their website saying, you know, oh, look, here's 10 features that our software has, and the competitor only has three of these 10 features, so ours is clearly better. Well, the software vendors, they all tend to look at those comparative matrix, and they know what their competitors are up to. So. What I've seen in the real world uh, in dealing with various software vendors is this mentality that, well, if our competition has this feature, we need it too. But they don't want to invest a lot of time and resources into building that feature because it doesn't really represent their core business. So what they'll do is they'll code something that's just good enough to get by on and bolted onto the application just so that they can say that it's got that particular feature. So what you end up with is kind of a disjointed experience where the application is really strong with regard to one feature and pretty weak with regard to something else. So just something to be aware of. So let's talk unified communications and what to look for when considering deploying a unified communication solution, uh, particularly in a small business environment. Uh, the first consideration is, do you actually need a unified communications solution? Well, if you've got an extremely small organization, the answer might be no. Um, I know that's probably not what I'm supposed to say in a uh, um, session like this, but it's the absolute truth. If you've got an organization with five people, ten people, it might be more cost effective and ultimately easier just to give everybody a smartphone and let them call, send text messages or FaceTime or whatever, rather than investing in a true unified communication solution. Ultimately, it's all about the business's needs and about the potential return on investment. So you've got to consider whether or not the unified communication solution is actually a good fit for the business. Now, when you start getting into organizations that are a little bit bigger, those uh, small to medium-sized businesses, well, in a, a lot of cases with organizations like that, then yes, unified communications can be justified. But even in those types of situations, you have to look at the cost and you have to look at the advantages and disadvantages associated with deploying a solution like that. So let's talk about some potential benefits. Uh, there are quite a few of them, um, but the, the one that Unified Communications is probably best known for is the simple fact that all of these different forms are, of communication are bundled into a single platform. So what that really means is that users have one app that they use for all of their communications. They're not constantly having to juggle between different apps and different forms of communications. So it also means that it makes it really easy for a user to use the type of communication that makes the most sense for them in a given situation. 
and we've all seen situations like this. Um, you know, may, maybe you want to ask somebody a question, but you're in a hurry and you don't want to get stuck on the phone, so you just send a quick text message or an instant message. Whereas in other situations where you need a lot more detail and you need to really delve into something, it might make more sense to make a phone call than to try to communicate back and forth with text and messages. So unified communications really put all different communication options at the user's fingertips so that they're free to pick and choose whatever makes the most sense for that given situation. Um, another thing that's really nice about com unified communications and one of the benefits is that communications can be routed based on a set of rules. So it doesn't matter whether a user is working in the office, if they're working remotely, communications can be set up so that they become location agnostic. It doesn't matter where a user is working, they can work in the same way regardless because they've got that unified communication application. You know, I, I hadn't even thought about this until just now, but when uh, cell phones really started first gaining mainstream popularity back in the early 90s, there was a TV commercial in which um, someone got a, a cell phone and they ended up using call forwarding on their desk phone at work and forwarded their calls to their cell phone. And the commercial showed their boss trying to call them and the call get, got forwarded and the guys at the lake fishing. So that's an example of calls being routed uh, to any location imaginable without having to worry about sacrificing the ability to communicate in the process. So another potential benefit, and I use the word potential, is increased productivity. Um, in some ways, productivity might be increased because there's no longer a need for a user to switch between communications applications or to have a whole bunch of different communications applications open at the same time. You're just making things a little bit more efficient on the end user. Uh, the disadvantage, of course, is that sometimes users might feel a little bit stressed as a result of this, especially if they're expected to be available at all times. Sometimes making things a little too easy can overwhelm the users. Um, we've all probably seen examples of this in the real world. Uh, think about Microsoft Teams, for example, and I'm not picking on Microsoft or anything like that, but Teams has a function where you can schedule focus time. So the, I think the message that's really being sent by just such a feature existing is that communications have become so pervasive and it's become so easy to get distracted by all the constant inbound communications, whether they're text messages, instant messages, phone calls, video calls, whatever, that it's gotten to the point in some organizations where users actually have to schedule time to do their actual work because the rest of the time they're busy putting out fires and dealing with all these inbound communications. And that can be really stressful on the end user, so that's one potential downside to unified communications. Not saying that you should rule out unified communication, certainly not. Just trying to cover all my bases and paint a fair picture with both the good and the bad. So another potential benefit, and again, I use the word potential, is that unified communications can potentially reduce operating costs. Um, and this largely comes in non-quantifiable costs in the form of employee productivity. Uh, so for example, if you've got employees that are constantly having to communicate with customers and with other coworkers and things like that, if you give them the ability to use short form communications, things like um, instant messages and stuff, then you're reducing the number of phone calls that they're making to one another, uh, thereby helping to save time, and that time can be used for more productive purposes. That's kind of the gist of saying that unified communications can potentially reduce operating costs and improve productivity. So another benefit that I've already touched on at least a little bit is that unified communications are ideal from work from home or hybrid work because the user has a completely consistent experience and can communicate in the same manner that they would be able to if they were in the office, regardless of where they're physically located. Uh, we saw this a lot during the pandemic. But the same flexibility can also help with disaster readiness. That's one of those things that I rarely hear anybody mention. You know, I can't help but think about an organization that I once worked for. It was a large insurance company. And this insurance company, to their credit, was really focused on disaster preparation and readiness. So one of the things that they did, and you have to remember that this was early 90s, was they created a, a, another site in a nearby city. It was only about an hour from the organization's primary site. They wanted it to be far enough away that it probably wouldn't be impacted should something happen to the organization's primary facility, 
but close enough that most of the employees could get there without too much trouble. So they created this failover um, facility, and one of the things that they did was they had workspace for most of their employees. They had set up desk phones, which were popular at the time, and they programmed phone numbers and everything, um, and they went through all of this trouble. And they even got with the phone company and put in a contract saying that the phone company, upon um, receiving notice, had four hours to switch all of the phone lines over to that alternate facility. So you can imagine what something like that must have costed them to implement. Between the real estate space, um, all of those extra phones, the agreement with the phone company, the cost had to be astronomical. Well, with unified communications, you don't have to worry so much about that because communications can follow the user because it's typically just going to be tied to an app, and that app can get installed anywhere. So that's a huge advantage of unified communications over what we might have had in the past. So with that said, now that I've talked about some of the pros and cons, let's talk about some important considerations with regard to deploying a unified communication solution and with selecting such a solution. So one of the first uh, considerations that you really need to keep in mind is, do you actually need unified communications capabilities? I touched on this at the beginning, so I'm not really going to go into that too much, aside from providing a follow-up question. If you do need unified communications capabilities as a business function, does the entire organization need those capabilities, or is it only a subset of the employees that are going to need that? And the reason why this is such an important consideration is simply because it affects the cost of the deployment. At a bare minimum, it's going to affect licensing costs, but if there's also hardware involved, then you're going to have to consider those costs as well. So why might only a subset of the employees end up needing unified communications capabilities? Well, again, this is one of those things that's really going to vary from one organization to another based on business function, but you may have a situation where only the executive management team needs unified communications capabilities. Or you might have certain users whose job functions really don't require that sort of thing. Uh, the insurance company that I mentioned earlier, they had employees whose sole job was data entry. And to the best of my memory, those employees didn't even have a phone on their desk. So certainly a position like that might not necessarily need unified communications capabilities. And if you can ex exclude a large block of employees uh, from unified communications just based on not needing that in order to do their job, well, then you drastically reduce your cost. So just something to think about. Which leads me to the next uh, question of consideration is, what is it going to cost? Well, unfortunately, when it comes to unified communications, the costs aren't necessarily cut and dry. Um, the vast majority of the cloud-based providers out there that I've seen will give you an online quote and tell you it's going to cost X number of dollars per user. Um, some hide the cost and make you contact a sales associate, but the point that I wanted to make is that the cost that you see on the website isn't necessarily going to be the cost when all is said and done, because sometimes there are ancillary costs that come into uh, play besides just the uh, licensing cost. So yes, you have to consider the cost of the licenses, but you also have to consider the cost of any hardware that might be required. So if you're using a cloud-based solution, then that hardware could be something as simple as a headset to plug into a PC. Um, or you may not even need that. It, uh, users might simply install an app on their cell phone and be done with it. But in other organizations, you might need desk phones, you might need PBX systems. Uh, there may be hardware that you have to consider the cost of. There's also the cost of support that you have to consider. Now, some providers do provide free support. Some provide support on a paper incident basis. And then I've heard of at least a couple of providers out there that actually require their customers to sign a support contract, and there's an annual cost associated with that support contract. So that's something that needs to be figured into the overall cost. Uh, the next thing is phone line cost. Now, what I mean by phone line is for organizations that need PSTN capabilities associated with their um, unified communications platform. Uh, PSTN, um, that, that's public switch telephone network, just old school telephone. If you need the ability to dial out, you're obviously going to have to have phone lines in order to do that. And every unified communications platform that supports PSDN is going to need access to phone lines in order for users to be able to make phone calls to the outside world. 
you don't need that for internal phone calls between users, but you are going to need that in order to dial to the outside world or for people in the outside world to be able to call in and reach your users. So there's going to be a cost that's associated with those phone lines. And very often that's going to be an add-on cost, and it's going to be a significant add-on cost. Some of the platforms that I've seen, um, depending on how many lines you're actually leasing, the cost of those phone lines can actually exceed the licensing cost for the platform itself. I've seen a, a couple of examples of that in the real world. So once you get past the cost of the phone lines, another cost to consider is per, per call charges. Now, again, not every provider bills you based on the calls that you make, but I have seen providers do that. So the idea being that you pay a certain amount per month for the service, but then there's going to be an ancillary cost that gets added to the bill each month based on the number of calls that the users have made during that month. And then there may also be setup cost. Again, not every provider does this, but there are some that will charge you a certain amount in order to set up the solution. So let's talk about some more questions that you need to consider when choosing a unified communications platform. Uh, the next question is, what unified communications features do you actually need? If you think back to the very beginning of the presentation, I had two slides where I listed some of the more common unified communications features. Not every organization is going to need every single one of those features. So it's a good idea when you're first starting out just to make a list of what types of features you think your organization needs, or even if you don't immediately need them, what you think you might be able to benefit from. Because by making that list of features, you can kind of start narrowing down uh, your choice of providers based on who actually offers the features that you would find beneficial. Another thing to consider is what capabilities do you currently have in place? Um, so as you begin to evaluate those features, you might find, oh, we already have everything that we need, or we only need the small package to supplement what we've already got in place. Or you could end up just completely replacing everything. That's also a very viable option. Um, third question on the list, what communications tools are the users currently using and why? And the and why is a really important part of that question. So why are the users using what it is that they're using? Are they using it because they absolutely love that particular uh, communications platform and it, it's something that works really well for them? and meets all their needs? If so, then you might think twice about moving away from that and giving them something that may or may not work quite as well. Are they using it because that's the only thing that was available at the time or the only thing that fit the budget at the time? Or because somebody made a decision to buy that particular solution without really considering the needs of the users? Why are the users using what they're using and is it working for them? Uh, the next question, how did the users prefer to communicate? And this is one of those um, types of questions that you might actually want to engage with the users and have a conversation with them and find out how they prefer to communicate. Because it's really easy to assume that, okay, here's what the users do with their jobs, so this is the type of communication that's going to work best for them. But really, when it comes down to it, the person doing the job generally knows what's going to work best for the job. So engaging with the users and finding out what's working for them, what isn't working for them, and how they prefer to communicate, how they prefer to collaborate or share files if that's one of their job functions, that can go a long way toward helping to make your unified communication deployment a lot more successful and, to be quite frank, to be accepted by the users. Uh, next question on the list, is the current experience consistent for both remote users and users working on site? Why or why not? So in other words, whatever it is that you're doing right now, is the user cons experience consistent? Do users who are working away from the office have to do one thing and users working in the office have to do something completely different? And if there is a difference between the way that the users have to work based on their location, why is that? And is that something that you can solve um, going forward with your unified communication platform that you're thinking about? And typically the answer to that question is going to be yes. Um, also, what devices are your users using? In other words, how do they prefer to communicate? Do they generally work uh, solely from a PC? Do you have some mobile users who work from their iPhone or their Android devices? Do you have Mac users, Linux users? Um, do you have desk phones? You've got to take all of that into account because not every platform is going to work with every type of device. 
And even if you have a platform that is cross-platform, or let me rephrase that, even if you have a unified communications uh, service that is truly cross-platform and that will work on a variety of different hardware platforms such as iOS, Android, Windows, Mac, Linux, whatever, um, you may find that the user experience isn't consistent from one platform to another. Uh, there are any number of examples of this, not just in unified communications, but in all types of software, where a vendor will give a really great experience on one platform and kind of a subpar experience on another. So you can't just automatically assume that because a vendor supports a particular platform that the experience on that platform is going to be every bit as good as what it might be on some of the other platforms that that vendor supports. So another consideration is, is there a viable migration path from what you have now to the solution that you're considering deploying? And with regard to that particular question, yes, there are other considerations, but with regard to that particular consideration, what I'm really talking about is migrating historical data. Let's say that right now you've got an old school PBX system on premises, and for whatever reason, your call logging data is really important to you. Is there going to be a way to export that call logging data and then import it into the new system so that you've still got access to that data for as long as you need it? Or if that data won't cleanly import into the new system, can it be exported and put into some other reporting platform so that if the auditors come in and they need to see that data, you still have a way of pulling it up and searching that data? That's a very real consideration, uh, particularly in regulated industries. Uh, next question, if a migration path does exist, will the migration process require any service disruption? So in other words, you've got a system in place right now uh, that allows users to make calls, maybe video calls, maybe instant messaging, uh, whatever it is, and you decide that you're going to do a rip and replace. You're going to pull out those existing capabilities and put in some fancy new unified communications platform. How long of a service disruption can you anticipate as you make the transition over from the old platform to the new platform? And more importantly, what can you do to minimize the disruption to the business? Uh, there was one organization that I saw a few years ago that operated 24-7, so they, there wasn't really a time of day when they could take that platform, their existing platform offline in order to transition over to a new phone system. So they ended up having to get really creative about how they were going to do it uh, so that they could minimize the disruption to the business. And what this organization ultimately decided to do is to migrate in batches. So in other words, um, they started out with, it was probably about half of the users in the organization, and they moved them over to the new system. And they didn't just pick users at random, they picked a certain percentage of users from each department so that every department had users who were still on the old system. So they move a portion of the users over to a new system, and then they thoroughly test that, make sure everything's working, and only then do they migrate everybody else. So at any given time, there were users who weren't in the process of being migrated, so they could ensure that there was always somebody there who was available to answer the phones. So that's just one example of what one business did in order to minimize the service disruption that's associated with the migration process. So another consideration is, is the new platform easy to use? Now, on the surface, this might seem like a non-issue. Um, you know, ultimately, the users are going to use it, uh, regardless of whether it's easy to use, hard to use, whatever. But when you really start digging into this one, that's actually a, or whether or not the platform is easy to use is actually an important question. Because let's say that you end up buying some really obscure platform that is cumbersome and not the most intuitive. Well, at the very least, that platform is going to probably require excessive training. You may have to bring in all of your users and teach them how to use this new platform simply because it's too difficult to figure out on their own. So there are going to be costs associated with that. That's going to impact productivity. And it's probably the sort of thing that you want to avoid. Um, another thing is that if you've got a really non-intuitive platform, then the users are by nature going to kind of shy away from it they may not take full advantage of it. Maybe they'll only use a subset of its features just because it's hard to use and they want to just use the bare minimum without digging into the software any more heavily than they have to. And then the bigger problem is that if you've got something that the users don't like, and really this kind of goes back to what I was talking about a couple of slides ago about 
actually asking the users how they prefer to communicate and what they like, what they don't like. If you end up deploying something that the users don't like, then Shadow IT can become a problem. Uh, Shadow IT, for anybody who may not be familiar with the term, refers to the practice of users circumventing um, IT in order to find a quicker, easier way of getting their jobs done. Um, for example, at one time prior to uh, the rollout of the public cloud, IT had all the control. If a user came to the IT department and said, hey, we want to run this particular application, the IT department could simply say no, and there was nothing that the user could do about it. But then when the public cloud came along, if that user came to the IT department and said, hey, we want to uh, use this application, and IT said no, the user could say no problem. They break out the corporate credit card, they go to a cloud provider, set up an account, and boom, they're using that application without the IT department's knowledge or consent. That's what I mean by shadow IT. So think about that concept as it relates to unified communications. If you deploy a unified communications platform that the users really don't like very much, then the users might decide, you know what, I need to call so-and-so, and the system's a pain to use. I'm just going to whip out my iPhone and just call them direct. It's so much easier, so much simpler. Now, on the surface, that might not seem like a big deal because a phone call is a phone call, right? It doesn't really matter where it comes from. But if you're in a regulated industry where there's an audit trail that needs to be maintained, then having a, a user who steps outside of the normal uh, way of doing things and takes things into their own hand and calls someone through a non-authorized means, that could cause some serious complications with regard to your compliance requirements. And then one more thing that I'll quickly mention, and I've kind of touched on this a little bit uh, with regard to user satisfaction, is, as I mentioned earlier, occasionally you may find a unified communications platform where some features are really rich and others just feel like they've been kind of bolted on or maybe they're even an afterthought. Um, if that bolted on feature is something that the users depend on, well, that's going to result in a bad experience for those users who depend on it. So it's best to avoid that sort of thing if you possibly can. So one last consideration that I want to quickly mention with regard to the end user experience is that it's important to think about if your users like what they're currently using and if there's any features that the users are going to lose as a result to the transition to the new platform, and if losing access to that feature is going to be a problem for them. So just to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about, let me give you a real world example that has absolutely nothing to do with unified communications, um, nothing to do with IT for that matter. So the car that I drive, um, it doesn't really matter what it is or anything like that, but uh, generally I like it. Um, and it was starting to get quite a few miles on it. So last year I went to the dealership and uh, to see if they had a newer model of that car, um, just because I didn't like how many miles was starting to um, end up on it. And they did have a newer version of the car. It was a little bit more expensive, but I was willing to pay it simply because I liked the one that I've got now. But as I started looking at it, I noticed that the newer model of the car had a lot more plastic than the one that I've got. And I also noticed that there were a couple of features that they had taken away. Uh, for example, I live in the south where it's really hot. So one of the features that I really like is that there's a, a rear window shade that you can press a button and that shade will go up and help keep your car cool. And on the newer version, they had completely taken that away. You couldn't even buy it. You couldn't add it on as an option or anything. Uh, so that's an example of a feature that was taken away that was actually being used. Uh, the end result was that I didn't end up buying the car simply because I didn't like what had become of it. I felt like I was going to be losing too much. So to put this back in context with unified communications, you've got to think about how your users are working from the existing platform. If there's anything that they're going to lose by, as a result of transitioning to whatever platform you're thinking of deploying, and how losing that feature might impact them. Is it one of those things that if they lose it, it's not a big deal? Or are you taking away a critical feature that the users use every single day? Um, another consideration is, is it possible to perform a trial deployment? Ideally, anytime you're going to deploy a new unified communications platform, it's a good idea to get a trial. Now, depending on what you've got, particularly if we're talking about on-premises solutions, Sometimes this is easier said than done, but ideally you should do a trial deployment if at all possible. Now, what should you be looking for in a trial deployment? Uh, for starters, you want to evaluate the admin console just to make sure that it's going to give you all of the tools that you need. You also need to be looking at the end user experience and hopefully getting 
some real users to test drive it and give you preferably honest feedback as far as what works for them, what doesn't work for them, and that sort of thing. Incidentally, one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen people make with regard to trial deployments is finding that something doesn't quite work. Maybe it's not as reliable as they want it to be, and then just assuming that it has something to do with the way that the trial is set up and saying, well, we'll iron out the bugs when we go into production. A lot of times those bugs end up getting worse, not better. So just some food for thought there. Another thing to consider is integration. So in other words, you're bringing in this unified communications platform. How well is that platform going to integrate with what you've already got in place? I'm not even necessarily talking about other communication systems that you're using, although it could mean that. Uh, what I'm talking about is other IT systems, um, whether we're talking about desktop computers, back-end systems, storage, uh, legacy software, desk phones. How well is it going to tie into what you've already got? On the surface, that's an important question because it's going to impact your overall cost. Um, but there are a couple of other things to think about. If the system does integrate, well, then that's going to um, change your security considerations because any time that you attach something to your existing system, you're increasing the potential attack surface, and you have to consider that. So there may be some extra things that you need to do security-wise in order to prevent any security problems. If integration isn't possible, then you avoid that uh, security quandary, potentially, but there are other things to think about. For example, you may end up creating data silos. And that's not necessarily a problem in and of itself, but if you do create data silos, then you're going to have to think about how are you going to protect that data? Uh, what type of redundancy are you going to need? How are you going to back that data up? Uh, and that sort of thing. Another consideration is the service impact. Okay. Imagine for a moment that you're not yet using unified communications and you decide to adopt a unified communication platform. Well, every call that users make, um, whether that be a video call, voice call, instant messaging, whatever, that's going to place traffic on your network because all of those communications are being transmitted as IP uh, packets. So you're going to have to consider what type of load that's going to put on your network and if you have the required bandwidth to handle that. You're also going to have to consider your remote users and whether there's going to be any bottlenecks that are going to cause problems for remote users. Typically, the bottlenecks are only going to be an issue if you're hosting your own solution on-premises and all of the users have to come through some sort of gateway to get into your organization. If you're using a cloud-based solution, the bottleneck issue typically isn't going to rear its ugly head. But what you do have to think about with regard to your remote users is how much bandwidth they're going to need in order to have a good experience. Uh, one of the big things that I was hearing a lot about during the pandemic when everyone was working remotely was people who would try to have a Zoom meeting with their coworkers and end up just having a terrible experience. The video would freeze or cut out or whatever. And sometimes it was because their kid was watching Netflix in the next room and using a lot of bandwidth. But other times it was simply because um, the user didn't have enough bandwidth to accommodate the session in the first place. So they ended up having a subpar experience. So you do have to consider how much bandwidth is going to be needed in order for your remote users to have a good experience. And then one more consideration before I move on to other things is the ease of deployment. In other words, what's going to be involved in actually setting up the system? If you're using a cloud-based service, then typically it's going to be very easy to deploy because the provider does most of the work for you. And you know, I've always been really big into the do-it-yourself approach, and I tend to do things on-premises as um, opposed to in the cloud whenever I can. But when it comes to unified communications, I would strongly recommend a cloud-based solution whenever possible, unless you just happen to have somebody on-premises who is an expert in SIP, PBX, and things like that. If you're not familiar with those terms, SIP is the Session Initialization Protocol, and PBX stands for Private Branch Exchange. Um, if you think about landlines, uh, the phone company has an electronic switch that routes telephone calls. Well, a PBX is essentially a smaller version of the phone company switch that goes in your office, and it's what all of the desk phones connect to. And quite a few years back, I had um, a book that I wrote on telecommunications, and one of the things that I covered in that book was setting up a PBX switch. And let me tell you, before I wrote that book, I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself into. Um, 
setting up a PBX is quite a bit more complicated than I ever would have guessed. I just kind of assumed that you could start plugging in phones and then phone lines to the outside world and everything would work and the software would do most of what needed to be done. Uh, but it's not like that at all. There is quite a bit of programming that has to be done before you even get a dial tone on any of the phones that are plugged in. You have to assign phone numbers, and then you also have to do normalization strings. Um, I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but the idea being that, say, a user tries to call someone outside of the organization. They might dial it as a local number with seven digits. They might dial it as a long-distance number with area code and then the seven digits. They might tack on a country code. Well, you have to tell um, the PBX how to handle all of those different ways that the, a number could potentially be dialed and then set up all of these different routing rules. And it, it's a huge job. So all of that is to say that if you have the in-house expertise, there's certainly nothing wrong with setting up your own PBX, but you can save yourself a whole lot of heartache by setting up a cloud-based solution instead. Uh, one more thing to consider is scalability. Can the solution that you're considering handle your anticipated workload? And if it can, um, how easy is it going to be to add extra capacity in the future as your organization grows? Uh, one more thing to consider is that if the solution can handle your anticipated capacity, um, what about call con concurrency? It's one thing to say that this particular system can accommodate X number of devices. It's a completely other thing to allow all of those devices to communicate at the same time. Um, that insurance company that I mentioned earlier, they had a particular incident. I won't get into the incident, but it caused pretty much everybody to run to the phones and try calling the outside world. Well, the organization only had so many phone lines for the outside world, so even um, nobody ever planned for all of those desk phones to be in use at the same time trying to make outside calls. So needless to say, the first couple hundred people managed to get through on outside phone lines. But after that, nobody could get through. They couldn't access an outside phone line because all of those were in use. That's what I mean by planning for call con concurrency, making sure the system can handle the anticipated number of simultaneous calls. And of course, you also need to consider things like support and reliability. In other words, if the solution is cloud-based, what kind of SLA is the provider giving you? Uh, SLA being service level agreement. Um, what type of uptime and availability are they guaranteeing you? If the solution is on-premises, then what can you do on your end to make sure that it remains highly available? Because remember, communications is a key business function. Uh, also, the vendor that you're using for your unified communication solution, what type of response time are they guaranteeing you for uh, support incidents? And what's support going to cost you? Are you paying for a support contract? Are you paying per incident? What's it going to take to get the support that you need when incidents occur? And is there anything that could potentially cause your deployment to be designated as unsupportable? Uh, this is one of those things that I haven't seen it very often with regard to unified communications, but I've seen it with other types of software. An organization will deploy a piece of software, and they do it in kind of a non-standard way, and they end up having a problem, and the support department says, well, sorry, in order for us to support this, it has to be set up like this, and you didn't do that, therefore we're washing our hands of it, and it's your problem, not ours. So the lesson there is that you never, ever want to configure anything in a manner that will cause it to be designated as unsupported, because if you have a problem, then you may not be able to get the help that you need. Another consideration is what types of call analytics features are going to be available to you. So call analytics are certainly important for compliance um, types of metrics, but even if your organization isn't subject to any compliance regulations, uh, call analytics can help you to verify call quality to make sure that users are having a good experience. Uh, Microsoft Teams, for example, has a call quality dashboard that you can use to keep track of audio quality on all of the different calls so you can see what the experience is like for your users. But call uh, analytics can also help you to verify SLA compliance. So if you see a whole bunch of calls dropped and your SLA says this shouldn't happen, well, then you know you need to contact that vendor. So what are some barriers to unified communication deployment? Well, I've only got a few minutes left, but I want to quickly go through some of these barriers. And these came from connectteam.com, uh, their unified guide to or excuse me, their ultimate guide to unified communications. There's a link down at the bottom to the page where these came from. Uh, the first item, not surprisingly, is high cost. 
And they go on to say that, according to a survey by Jabra, who is a headset manufacturer, 73% of companies with more than 5,000 employees cited cost as being an obstacle to implementing unified communications. And then they go on to say that while the solutions themselves might not be very high priced, the hardware support and staff required to run the systems can really add up, not to mention the cost of training that's largely affected by the end user interface and cost solutions. So this goes back to what I was saying on one of those earlier slides about the uh, licensing costs typically don't represent the total cost of operating the system. Uh, the next thing on their list was a bad user interface or a bad user experience. And then they go on to say that 71% of employees surveyed make use of only some of the communications tools their employers make available to them. When asked why, over a third admitted that they simply didn't know how to use some of the tools offered by the UC platform in their organization. And then they go on to say that, sure, you can throw a lot of money on training your employees on all the shiny features of your UC solution, but without an easy-to-use interface, non-software developers, read normal people, will actually use and dare, uh, we say love, it's money flushed down the toilet. So what they're really saying is that the, um, the interface has to be easy to use, otherwise the users are likely going to reject it. Then we have employee resistance, which kind of ties back to what I was just talking about, but they say people don't like change. Adjusting to new communications tools and developing new habits is hard enough, but people bring their anxieties to work with them. Some hate to announce their availability to their coworkers. That goes back to the presence information that I showed on the very first slide. Um, if you're setting your presence to not busy, well, people are going to say, hey, if this person's not doing anything, this would be a great time to bother them about this, that, and the other. And then they go on to say others get downright paranoid thinking their bosses are spying on them through their phones and computers, which, yes, that does happen in some organizations. So it's important to include them in the evaluation and selection process, but even then success is not guaranteed. So what they're really saying is what I was talking about earlier, about actually engaging with your, their users, find out what's working, what's not, and what you can do to make their lives better. Then we have interoperability issues. And they say old legacy systems don't play well with new unified communication solutions. So sometimes instead of making things more effective, they end up making things worse. Another issue to consider is bandwidth limitations. A UC system used by all employees in the office can put a strain on the local network, and it's often hard to foresee bandwidth requirements when setting up a UC solution. So this all goes back to what I was saying earlier about Every call that's made is going to consume bandwidth on your network, and so you've got to make sure that all of these simultaneous calls aren't going to collectively overwhelm the system. Whatever you put in place, it needs to work at least as well, preferably better than what you already have. So I'll go ahead and get into maybe one or two screens of best practices, and then I want to leave just a, a few minutes at the end for some questions because I'm rapidly running out of time. Um, so best practices. First one, make sure to get stakeholder buy-in prior to adopting a unified communication solution. While you might have the authority to arbitrarily make a decision and purchase a solution on behalf of your company, it's a lot better to go ahead and get buy-in from some of the stakeholders because then when the finger pointing starts, and it always does, then you can remind them that they were involved in the decision-making process and that it wasn't just all you. Think of it as self-preservation. Uh, the next one, work with the organization's leaders to determine the per-minute cost of a unified communications failure and make sure that your contingencies are adequate to prevent the organization from suffering excessive ha should be harm should an outage occur. So in other words, in any organization, an outage is going to result in financial loss, and the per-minute cost of that financial loss is going to vary from organization to organization. But if you can determine what that per-minute cost is going to be, then you can develop an SLA that's going to keep the organization from suffering excessively. And then you can take steps to make sure that that SLA is met as a way of helping to protect that organization from suffering excessive financial harm. And then the last one on the slide, have a system in place to proactively identify and correct issues before they become a problem. In other words, your unified communications platform is a mission critical system. Everybody depends on it because they can't communicate with coworkers or with customers without it. So it's really, really important to have a system in place to look for any issues that might be occurring on your network so that you can do something about those issues before they really begin to interfere with your ability to communicate with the outside world. 
So with that, I'm just going to go ahead and skip over the last couple of slides and go to audience question and answer so that we have time to get in a few questions. Okay. Great stuff, Brian. And we do have some questions in the Q&A console, and we'll get right to those. But first, I wanted to examine a question, two similar questions from the first session and this session. As a reminder, in the first session, there was a question to Howard. Are you saying small and medium businesses should not build their own unified communication system? And Howard said, definitely yes. Now there's a question in the inbox that says, are you saying that deploying a physical PBX is going to be too big of a task for a small business to do without outside help? What's your take on that, Brian? I would say it's going to depend on a few things. Uh, one, it's going to depend on the PBX itself. Some are a little easier to set up than others. Um, but it's also going to depend on what expertise the organization has in-house. Uh, setting up a PBX is a big undertaking. Uh, take it from somebody who's done it. Um, Having said that, if your business focuses around communications and you know PBX is inside and out, I'd say go for it. Uh, there's no reason not to. But if, on the other hand, um, your business is in IT, um, you're just trying to get this thing up and running so you can move on and run your business, well, it's probably going to be a lot better to adopt a cloud-based solution, or at the very least, if you want a physical PBX, uh, hire somebody who knows what they're doing to set that thing up for you because it's a very – involved in the error-prone process. Okay. Moving right along, here's a question from Bob in the audience. How does SIP talk with PBX? Okay. SIP is the session initialization protocol. Um, communications don't actually flow over SIP. SIP's only job is to start the communication process. It, um, the actual communications themselves, um, so the communication between the desk phone and the PBX, actually get handled by other protocols. SIP is only there to get things started. Okay, moving right along to the next question. Do you think that companies will continue to invest in remote communications capabilities in a post-pandemic world? That's going to be really tough to say, but um, here's my take on it. Um, in 2020, when the world shut down, organizations invested like crazy in remote work solutions, and a big part of that was unified communication so that all their users who were suddenly working from home had the ability to continue to communicate with customers and with their coworkers and that sort of thing. So a really big investment's already been made in that. So my prediction would be that what we'll see immediately is a bit of a lull in investing in unified communication simply because everybody's recently bought it. But having said that, I think in a few years you're going to start seeing organizations begin to reevaluate what they have in place and start investing in unified communications once again. Okay, great. I think we have time for one more question, and it reads, is it possible to get a price break from a unified communications provider if there are certain features, such as PSTN, that you don't need? Uh, it would kind of depend on the provider and on the feature. Um, generally, if you go to a provider and say, hey, you're – your solution offers instant messaging, but I don't need that. They'll say, well, it just comes with that, um, and they're not going to give you a discount on the license uh, because that's just a built-in feature. But when we're starting to talk about uh, PSTN, typically the dial plans are going to be separate for a unified communications platform. Uh, so in other words, you're paying one price to license the platform itself, but you're paying a completely separate fee to license those phone lines that are connected to it. So if you don't need that, you can typically save a huge amount of money on the cost. Okay, great. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have time for. So thanks again, Brian, for an excellent presentation and answering all those questions. Thanks for having me.